morning. Good morning, good morning. How are you? What a lovely day. Notice the tan. Have you seen the sun tan? Getting to picking up a bit of colour. Oh, I'm late. I'm not late, but I'm not early. The school bus has gone past a long time ago. They uh, closing this road for roadworks, which is if they're closing all sorts of roads, it's a feature of the, sort of the public sector, alloc you know, funding allocation. That as soon as the financial year starts, first of April. Now we're in May, aren't we? And now all of a sudden they've got to, uh, says it's closed Tuesday the 30th of May, five days. Well, today is Tuesday the 30th of May. So let's see, let's see if we can draw another lesson about public sector provision of services from this road closure. The first lesson I've drawn is that there's traffic coming the other way. So it can't be much of a road closure, can it? Oh, there they all are, sitting in a lay-by. They're all sitting in a lay-by. So the first, what lesson do we draw? What's the first lesson we draw? Is that if the job's supposed to be done, it almost always starts late. So, this is, we know this, we know this. This is not just like a one-off on this job. I mean, I'm, I said, I said to my wife, I said to Mrs. Angry, I said, I'm off now. She said, don't forget the road's shut. She said, you know, you've got to allow a bit more extra time because the road will be shut. And then we looked at each other and she said, nah. She said, might be, by mid-morning it might be shut. But it won't be shut. By the time you get through, she said, it won't, they won't have. They'll still be sitting around drinking their coffee out of their thermoses. And sure enough, there they are in Melon's Farm, Mellard's Farm or whatever it's called. Blimey, just ate a pigeon. Just ate a bloody collar neck pigeon. Still, it was only a little nudge. I've just nudged it off its flight path. It's probably going to end up in Beijing now due to strong headwinds. So, yeah, and what's the other lesson we can learn? Is that the budgets are so mismanaged that they can only really do any work at one time of the year which is as soon as the new budgets come in, 1st of April. So there they go, they, they sort of spent a month allocating the money and now they can do a bit of resurfacing. And then when the money runs out, which it probably will do around about August, that'll be your resurfacing done for the year. The, uh, the old uh, dental budget is getting a bit like that. As soon as it became centrally managed and a, and a contracting uh, service rather than uh, you know like um, it used to be in the old days where they used to pay out all year round depending on demand um, we've got a situation where uh, there used to be a ton of ton of activity coming up to the targets because again they run on a April to April basis and so um, let's say that you've got you know, a contract for, I don't know, however many, 2,000 UDAs or something, off the top of my head, man, number doesn't matter. And uh, towards the end of the year, you're not going to uh, reach it. So let's say, so this is the case where the UDA target is is difficult to achieve. What will happen is you'll get a, a ton of activity in uh, February, March, won't you? And uh, then, then what will happen is, uh, the, the, the uh, April-May activity will slow down, relative. Um, but the alternative scenario is where the target is sort of, uh, you don't have, your target's not big enough. And you want a bigger target, but you can't get it. And there the activity is the other way around. There you, uh, all your activity is in the early part of the financial year. And then what happens is you run out of units, and so, you, you've achieved your target by, by I don't know, no, November or something, December, and then you've got no no units left for the rest of the year. The Department of Health discourages this, of course, and 
tells people to sort of ration it out because they don't like to they don't like it to be so obvious that you know like for four months of the year you can't get treatment at any NHS dentist um, they uh, they far rather you you know like <laughs> far rather one third of the patients can't get treatment at every NHS dentist every month that suits them better so anyway that's by the by so with this road closure when they finally get around to, when they finish their sandwiches and that and got around to inconveniencing us for a week to fill in a pothole or whatever it is they're doing um, I'm going to have to find another way in to work, which is, you know, is another nine, I mean, I spend two pounds a day at that paper shop, and so let's say it's going to be shut for five days, well, I've managed to spend it today, so it's going to cost them eight quid, because uh, my eight pound, plus, plus the voucher I got for the time, so, you know, say 16 quid, it's going to cost them to shut that road, and you can say probably, well, Economically, they're better off because they've got a new road, haven't they? Uh, for, for, but on the other hand, they're entitled to a new road <laughs> without having to suffer the economic consequences of having all their customers excluded. But apparently the girl in the shop who lives locally, and they all do live locally, said, uh, you know, around here everyone's, you know, they've heard of London as a concept. They, they think it exists, but they, none of them have actually ever been there. <clears throat> it's a bit like Nirvana. And she told me that there's a way that I can <clears throat> turn left and right and right and left again and sort of get around the roadworks. So I don't know if Google's going to know that. But I like, I do like trying to, I do try and support the shop, you know, because if you don't support it, then it's going to disappear and then that's going to put me to a lot of inconvenience. So try and find the nearest, next nearest shop, which is nowhere, no, certainly not, there's not anything on my route, I don't know about you, I mean if you live in London you've probably got hundreds of places you could nip into on, on route, but I drive for, I don't know, half an hour, and there's one petrol station on route, and there is one you know, there are a few places I can stop en route, but not really sort of stop, you know, I mean, there's a few, like, uh, garages where, well, the, the garage has got a co-op attached, that's what I'm trying to say. So, it's a, it's a desert, it's a retail desert, this part of Ken. Mind you, I like that, <laughs> it's good. <laughs> I remember when I got my GPS, because I'm going to have to rely on my GPS to take me through these back roads. I remember when I got the GPS and it's useful when you're driving from A to B you usually know how to get there or if you're driving from B to C you know how to get there the difficult or, or, or yeah I was gonna say uh, A to C but then it's getting B to C you know it's where you where you're you're at a destination and you need to get to another destination without going back through your origin and that's where the old GPS comes in I've seen some fantastic uh, parts of the country using the GPS. Places I'd have never gone to. And my world shrank, you know. I started following the GPS. There's a bloke, trying, there's a bloke driving past me and he's just decided to sort of drive past me and creep past. I don't like that. I do not like that. I get the feeling I'm being clocked. He's gone now anyway. Decided to put it in third gear. Uh, yeah, so, my, I, so I started using the GPS and all of a sudden my world shrank, you know? I was like, oh my god, I don't believe this place is as, so close to this other place. <coughs> These two places I normally spend an hour. I think I'm not going to go there because it's an hour away. Apparently it's only around the corner. <laughs> uh, all of a sudden my entire universe went whoosh, <laughs> shrank. 
so now I use the GPS a lot. In fact, if I was on Desert Island and I'm Sue Lawley said to me, what would you take as your luxury on the Desert Island? I would say a GPS. Which is a bit stupid really, because this Desert Island's only gonna be about like a mile across, isn't it? So last thing I'm gonna need is a GPS. Tell them a bit later than normal because all the traffic's building up. You ever try that trick where you want to turn left at a roundabout? So what you do is you get in the right hand lane and then go round the roundabout. I'm just about to try that. It's actually faster for me to go on. I'm faster for me to go that way, but the trouble is it brings you onto a road where, where which is always chock a block with traffic. And so you have spent 20 minutes waiting. Whereas this, this way is slightly longer around the airport, but it gets me to the front of the traffic. Brings you out a little road. You see, ah <laughs> it's not I'm not just the angry dentist, I'm the sneaky dentist as well. I had to give, um, had to terminate a contract with one of the associates over the weekend. It's always, uh, I very rarely uh, terminate associates contracts. In this case, it's, it's for a number of reasons, and it has to be for a number of reasons. I mean, you know, what the principle is that if a fault is what they call remediable in other words if it's like running late can it be fixed then yeah that's fine but um, if there's a variety of reasons and uh, most of them are non-remediable then uh, then there's not much you can do I think uh, it's a difficult period you know I was an associate myself and uh, um, you know, I know the, the three months statutory notice, which you're entitled to, is a very difficult period. And what happened was when I was given, I was given notice by my, <laughs> my principal was an idiot. I mean, I was waiting to join uh, the DPA as their secretary, so I needed like an interim job just while the... Uh, I think for six months or something while I was waiting to join because so I sold my practice and uh, so I, started, I worked as an associate for a bit and the guy who I knew, I knew, you know, and he said to me I'm looking for an associate and I said well I'll come and work for you for a bit as an associate and um, the problem was he said to me, I'm, the, my problem is he said I'm rushed off my feet He said, I've got a, you know, I'm, my, my, how can I, it was all to do with percentages. Basically, his, his expenses, he said, were something like 60%. Everything he took home, he took home, that's it. I mean, basically what it boiled down to was he was only taking home 40% of his gross, right? So what he did was he said, I'm, I'm taking home 40% of everything I earn. He said, and I can't afford to pay the bills because I need to take home like 50% of everything I gross. So I need to get someone in who can earn some profit, um, who can sort of help me earn what I'm supposed to earn and they will earn what they're supposed to earn, etc. And he forgot two, fact, fact, you know, two cast iron facts of life with regard to associates. And one is that they compete with you for the work which is, you know, goes without saying. But I suppose he thought that there was enough work for the two of us. And then the other thing was, um, he put me on uh, 50%. <laughs> well, I don't know why, because we knew each other and he was too embarrassed to put me on 45% or something, but he'd already admitted that his expenses were 60% of the gross, right? And then he put me on 50% of the gross. 
So between me and the expenses, we were earning 110% of the gross, which meant that he was um, he was doomed from day one. From day one, he'd actually made his situation worse. I don't know, to this day, I don't know why he didn't realize that. It was just simple maths, you know? Six plus five equals 11. <laughs> and I realized it straight away. Now, I know you could say to me, angry, you're a bit naughty there. Not saying to him straight away, I don't know, I don't think this is gonna work because it was 60% of my, my gross going on expenses and 50% going on my wages. It seems to me you're gonna to have to work even harder just to pay me. But, you know, <laughs> it's, we struck a deal and that was it. And uh, I mean, I presume he knew, I, well, I, I mean, I presumed he, that's the whole thing is, like both parties go into it possibly thinking that they've got one up on the other person and not knowing whether the other person may have got one up on them. So you can't really, uh, you know, you can't, I know they say you never interrupt your enemy when he's making a mistake and, uh, and it did feel a bit like that. But, you know, I mean, as the months went by, it became more and more clear that uh, it wasn't, he had made a mistake. And so uh, in the end, he just uh, gave me three months notice and then um, instructed the receptionist not to book me in any more patients for, the, for that three month period. Uh, and so what happened was I kept coming in, you know, as, as I always had done for work. And, um, you know, I had like 30 patients, then 20, then 10, and then five and then two. And, uh, the staff were embarrassed. He was nowhere to be seen. And, uh, this, you know, they made a mockery of the three month period. The three month period, you know, you, you don't expect to work normally during that three month period you know, because you're, uh, especially if you're something like an implantologist or something, then really, you know, you can't really start any work, can you? In the three month notice period, what are you going to start in the way of implants? Because you can't place anything because you can't you won't be around to uncover it and you're binding out uh, clauses in your contract is going to stop you um, seeing them at another local practice unless it's by agreement with the uh, the principal come on then if you want to treat the place like a racing ground come through There's a little roundabout there, and, and, and mainly for the people who are coming straight through, they just see it as like a chicane. It's just like, whoosh, they, come to, they don't look to see if there's anybody on the roundabout, you know, or pulling onto the roundabout, or already committed to pulling onto the roundabout. They just, uh, they just come through at 50 mile an hour if they can. It comes as somewhat of a surprise to them that you know, people are actually using it as a roundabout. Yeah, so I'm going to go into a really tricky three-month period now with this uh, this guy, and although he's nice enough, I mean he's a lovely guy, and uh, but he's, you know, as an economic agent, you must expect him to be driven by greed and self-interest, and uh, he certainly is. <laughs> he's, he's certainly an economic agent to the full. To that, to, to that extent. So, it's uh, going to be, uh, we'll have to see how it pans out. Anyway, we've got another short week, haven't we? Because we had a bank holiday Monday. So, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I've been out to... Uh, cutting grass and stuff and trimming hedges the, the plants go mad don't they this time of year I'm gonna have to come home tonight and do trimming I've got a leak underneath the floor in the surgery it's the third time we've had to get the floor up the first time we thought we fixed the leak and the second time we you know we realized we hadn't but we thought we definitely had and now 
we've got an, the leak again and so now we've realized that what we thought we'd fixed the first couple of times is almost certainly not the actual leak so I'm gonna have to have the floor back up again but rather than come down on a weekend and do it myself I'm going to find out what's the least busy session of the week and then get the nurses to do it <laughs> they can do it it's only pulling up some lino right here I am have a nice day see you soon bye